Hi, welcome back to my channel. My name is Terry, and in this video, I'm going to be reviewing the Ignatius Catholic Study Bible Old and New Testament Edition. It's a imitation leather cover, and I'm going to... Okay, I've got my tape measure thing. It is about seven and a half inches wide. I'm measuring the cover, by the way. Um, it is about uh, 10 and a fourth. Yeah, about a 10 and a fourth that way. And then thickness wise, sorry, I bumped the camera. It is like almost two and three quarters inches thick. That's, you know, measuring the cover. Um, later on, I'll have to try and look up what the uh, actual measurements are that the uh, publisher has. All right. Um, next thing I'm going to look at is going to be showing you, uh, going over the front cover. Okay, so it says Ignatius Catholic Study Bible Old and New Testament. Then it's got a picture in the cover of the four evangelists with Jesus in the center. Sorry, Max is off camera playing. Um, for those who don't know, Max is my cat. He was in my previous video where I unboxed this. He's an orange tabby. All right, and then it says RSV, second Catholic edition. Now, I'm gonna have to lift it up. It's a heavy Bible. This is not the type of Bible I would think people would carry to church because it's heavy. If they come out with a Kindle or ebook edition of it, that you'd be able to easily take anywhere. Oh, bump the camera again. Um, it says Ignatius, the Ignatius Catholic Study Bible, Old and New Testament, Revised Standard Version, Second Catholic Edition, and Ignatius um, Bible's uh, logo. I'm going to turn it over. Oh, I forgot. This was a dusty table. Sorry about that. Um, but yeah, it's, then it has nothing on the back. It's in person. It's a bluish color with kind of a marble effect to it. I want to say it's almost a bluish green. It's almost towards green, but it's still kind of bluish. I don't know if that'd be teal or what. Um, and then you got... These textured end pages. Um, they're thick. I do not know what the GSM on is. I will try and find out what the GSM is before this video is over. Um, anyway, we got the title page, then the publisher's title page. And it, you know, tells you um, about the translation it's history going back to the King James of 1611. This edition was revised according to the Tergium Authenticum in 2001. With essays, introductions, commentary, charts, and notes by Scott Hahn, PhD, general editor, and Curtis J. Mitch, MA, co-editor, maps by David, Natalie, and Lauren Thomas. And then it's got the Nihil Abstat and the Imprimatur, uh, both in 1966 for the RSV, and then for the introductions, essays, and all that, May 8th, 2024. Um, second Catholic edition was approved by the National Council of Churches of Christ, who are the ones that own the copyright to the Revised Standard Version. Um, the cover art was done by Christopher J. Pelicano, and cover design was by Rox and May Loom. Um, the copyright on the biblical text is 2006. This was published by Ignatius Press in 2024. There is a hardback uh, leather bound, which is what this one is called. Even though it's imitation leather, they're calling it leather bound. And then... Um, there is an ebook ISBN number, and then there's the Library of Congress uh, number, and this is printed in India. And then here's our table of contents. 
It's got abbreviations for the books of the Bible, contributing writers, introduction to the Ignatius Catholic Study Bible. I recommend if it's your first time using this or even the New Testament, which I'll show in a few, a little bit to compare some things, um, read that. That will help you understand how to use this. The Catholic Church and Sacred Scripture by Jeffrey Morrow, PhD. The Catholic Canon of Scripture by Matthew J. Thomas. And an overview of salvation history by John S. Bergsma, PhD. And then we get to the, the biblical text. And there's an introduction to the Pentateuch. Then there's Genesis with its introduction. And then the text and commentary and so on with each book of the Bible. And every time there's a major section, there's an introduction to that major section. Which is normal in study Bibles these days. Um... So with Psalms and Wisdom Literature, you get an introduction to that, and then you go through that. And then the Prophets. And then the New Testament. For the New Testament, there's an introduction to the Gospels, then an introduction to Paul and his letters. Then there's an introduction to the Catholic Epistles. And then I think there might be an introduction to Revelation. I'm not sure. Oh, no, it covers the Catholic epistles, including Revelation, which is all, which is an epistle, too. Um, uh, index of charts, index of maps, index of topical essays, index of word studies, index of doctrines, index of parables, index of miracles, um, a biblical historical timeline, and liturgical calendar. All right, I'm not going to be able to show everything in this video because otherwise this video will be horrible really, really long. This Bible is almost 2,500 pages, if I remember right. Or 2,400 pages. All right. I'm going to have to stand up. I'm trying to sit on a stool. I don't want my stool to make noise. All right. The abbreviations of the books of the Bible. For Protestants watching this video, you'll see that for Tobit, the um, abbreviation for it is T-O-B. And then, like, uh, Judith, where is Judith? J Judith is J Judith is J U D. Sirach is S I R. Wisdom of Solomon is W I S. You know, that helps. And then, like, in the New Testament, Jude is just Jude. So that way you can easily tell that apart from Judith. And then these are contributing writers to articles, essays, and commentary. Um, and then there's a footnote here. All New Testament books have the same credit line. Matthew through Revelation by Scott Hahn and Curtis J. Mitch. All right. This is what you want to read right here when you first get this. Because this will explain everything you need to know about how to use this. And it'll also go into other details, like it'll talk about the inspiration and inerrancy of scripture. Um, and I skipped a page, sorry. Biblical authority, criteria for biblical interpretation. Um, for Protestants watching this, yes, this is an aspect of Catholicism. Catholics um, do are able to learn how to interpret the Bible, but the Catholic Church has, I think there's like three passages or books, I don't remember if it's books or passages, that have an official interpretation from the church. Other than that, theologians are the ones who do the primary interpretation, but this article does explain how interpretation is done by the theologians, I believe, as well as by the, ch the church itself. Um, and next, an explanation of the symbols. So when you see an open scripture, notes marked with the book icon relate to the content and unity of scripture. I'm not going to read the entire paragraph. Notes marked with the dove icon examine particular passages in light of the church's living tradition. So passages, of, if I'm understanding this right, these are passages of scripture 
that go with uh, the traditions of the church, like oral tradition and stuff. Because the Holy Spirit both guides the magisterium and inspires the spiritual senses of Scripture, these annotations supply information along both of these lines, okay? And then next, we have notes marked with the keys icon pertain to the analogy of faith. Here we spell out how the mysteries, mysteries of our faith unlock and explain one another. This type of comparison between Christian beliefs displays the coherence and unity of defined dogmas. And then there's a putting it all together, which is basically the context of the whole of scripture. I gotta sit back down again, my legs are hurting. All right. And then it's the Catholic Church in Sacred Scripture. I didn't show you where that begins. My apologies. Okay, so after this article, we have this article on the Catholic Church and Sacred Scripture. So it goes through like a history of Scripture and the Church. Because the Church, the Catholic Church, is the one who compiled all of the books for Christians into a canon and eventually published as a single volume. Prior to that, it was groups of scrolls and uh, manuscripts. And over time, the Catholic Church, within a few couple hundred years, within a couple hundred years of Jesus ascending into heaven, managed to realize what books were most helpful to Christianity as well as which ones they felt that the Spirit of God was speaking through the most. And so over the course of a few centuries, the canon was codified. And this article will explain how that happened. And the Council of Trent was the last major council to affirm the full canon of 73 books. And then this even goes into the 20th century. I wonder if it goes past the 20th century into the 21st century. Uh, yeah, it goes up to Pope Benedict XVI's um, Verbum Domine, the Word of God. Um, which looks like it might have come out in 2008. Nope, it was in 2010. I'd like to find that document and read the whole thing. I might have it somewhere. Uh, and then there's a summary of this article. And then the Catholic canon and scripture explaining why what the books that are in the Catholic canon are in the Catholic canon. So I'm not going to talk about that much. And then an overview of salvation history. Many study Bibles, both Protestant and Canon, usually have an article, something like this about uh, salvation history, or at least a lot of the ones that I have do. I'm not saying every single one of them does, but a lot of the ones I have do. And it goes through the different covenants, which are important to know. And then we get to the Old Testament. Title page for the Old Testament, really nice font. And then we have an introduction to the Pentateuch. Um, Pentateuch is Greek and it means five books. So it's referring to the books of Moses. Uh, and then, so this is going to explain the names of the books of the Pentateuch, how they came to be part of the canon. And it looks like this does bring up different theories of understanding the Pentateuch, um, like source criticism. That I don't think they're saying source criticism is the way to do it. I just think they're trying to make sure the readers are aware of it, that it exists and what it is and how it works. Um, and there are footnotes in this article. Let's 
Now we're into, oh, somehow I passed the title page for the introduction to Genesis. Okay, this is very important. Introduction to Genesis, it gives you author and date. Uh, what they mean by date is approximately when they believe uh, a book was written. Structure, literary background, the title, I skipped that. Um, so structure, title, literary background, themes, Christian perspective. Um, remember, the Old Testament is scripture shared between Christians and Jews. It's just uh, Jewish uh, believers in the one true God call it the Tanakh, which is an abbreviation of Torah, the Vim Kethavim, or uh, law or instruction then um, prophets, and then writings. I know a tiny bit of Hebrew. Um, okay, so after that introduction, sorry for that little uh, side bar there, um, we have an outline, which like if you're trying to find, say you're in a Bible study or you're wanting to study on your own, and you know there's a certain passage that has something you are looking for. Well, that's what these outlines can help you with. It can help you find something like if you want to find the story of the Tower of Babel, you you can look here and it'll tell you what chapter and verse that is. So you have an outline. Then for the actual text, we have the title. The full title here is the first book of Moses, commonly called Genesis. Genesis is actually a Greek word meaning beginnings um, or origin. Um, so then we have a subtitle for the section we're going to be in, and we have the chapter number. We have the first three verses here, then we have a solid line, and then we have cross-references. Here we just have a cross-reference to, from verse 1, chapter 1, verse 1, to John, meaning the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 1. Because there is a similarity when you look at the Septuagint. This first verse in the Septuagint reads very, very similar to verse 1-1 one, one of the Gospel of John in Greek. Um, and I have a feeling somewhere in here they will probably mention that because um, that's a very important part of it. And then you get these study notes. Um, when you see two study notes next to each other, which sometimes happens in multiple study Bibles that exist, that means this particular note covers these two kinds of topics or, you know, whatever the symbols would refer to. In this case, uh, the dove and the open book. We know that one of them has to do with uh, how God through scripture guides the church. And the other one was, I think it was more like an explan explanatory note on Yeah, the content and unity. So content and unity and then like how the how scripture guides the church. Um through the through the Holy Spirit. Well the Holy Spirit through Scripture does that. You have charts. Now, online I want to warn people about this a little bit. I don't think it should stop you from wanting to get this Bible. In some of these charts, there are small typos, which I don't think is a big deal. Um, because this is not, for one, this is not scripture. This is just a, a, a thing to help you think about scripture and in some ways help you to apply scripture to your life. This one in particular is about the six days of cre well, six days of creation plus God's day of rest. We have a word study here. Um, again, there is a, a, a line separating the biblical text cross-reference, a line, and then notes. Over here, since there is no cross-reference, there's just a line between the biblical text and the notes. Um, anyway, back to what I was going to say. Here we have a word study on image and likeness. It gives you both Hebrew words, and then it'll give you an explanation of them, and it'll show other places in Scripture where these words are used, and they'll explain to you 
the range, most likely the range of meaning of the words, because translating something from one language to another isn't as simple as saying hi in one language and saying hi in another. Languages are structured differently, so it's not exactly a one-for-one -one thing, the way languages work. So this is why you're going to get something like this, where they're going to show you how the words are used throughout Scripture and the meanings that, that come about based on context. And again, here we got, you know, study note symbols telling us what kind of note we're encountering. All right, I'm going to move on to a poetic section now. Now that you've got the, the, uh, a, a look at the text. Well, here we get a little bit of poetry in the book of Numbers, but I want to go to an actual book of one of the books of wisdom i'm carefully doing this because this is a new bible here we are in the psalms i want to go to the beginning of psalms and see what kind of an introduction we have for that because in some study bibles they'll break down the different types of psalms with a chart so that way like if you want to look up a certain kind of psalm let's see if they do that let's go to the beginning of this um, okay, so again, we have author, date, title, structure. This is a new Bible, so sometimes it takes a while to get them to not stick together. Um, <sighs> literary types, themes, and characteristics. And... Sitting on a stool to try and do this is tricky. Uh, the only reason I'm not doing this at the table is I'm tired of sitting in a regular chair. Um, I know there's a page there, just because I can see it. <laughs> it's just I don't want to bump the camera. I'm underneath the camera. Give me a minute. Bear with me. I'll try and edit this this little battle here out. Sometimes, if you, I'm not one of those people that lick their fingers, but there are people that will lick fingers to do that. I don't like doing that because then you permanently wrinkle your page. Anyway, it looks like they do have a breakdown of the Psalms, which I showed them, which I had a minute ago, and now it's not. Hold on. Ugh. Let's stretch my arm a minute. There we go. Christian perspective was the last section of that. And then we have it broken down by book one, book two, book three, book four, book five. And it kind of does tell you the types of Psalms. So it's not like the charts I was thinking of. Because I've seen charts where they'll say these are the Psalms of like mourning these are the psalms of gladness these are the psalms of thanksgiving or some charts will be like here are psalms to read when you're feeling this way or here's psalms to read when you're feeling that way this one doesn't do that at least not on this page it may do it somewhere in the book of psalms but we're not going to go through a whole book of psalms because we don't have time okay so it's poet laid out like poetry we have the chapter number we have subheadings and we Everything here telling us which book we're in because we're at the beginning of the book of the Psalms. We have a word study on the word blessed. We have a footnote here which talks about the number of Psalms. And it probably explains that, oh, it explains the compilation of it during the Dispora. Diaspora, sorry. But it also gives you an explanation of why for some of these psalms, you're going to see two different numbers for the psalm. Because one number is from the Vulgate, and I think the other one's either from the Masoretic text or from the Septuagint. Let's see. Uh... Oh, yep, yeah, Masoretic text. And then the other number is from the Latin Vulgate. Okay. So for some of these, for most of these, you're just going to see the Hebrew chapter number. 
Now, the actual Hebrew text does not have chapter numbers, verse numbers, or any of that. That was something that came about over very slow uh, stages in time. Um, for Christians, a Catholic monk came up with the chapter divisions. Verse numbers were created by a Protestant print or a printer who was in sympathy with the Protestants. Um, for Judaism, though, verse numbers and chapter divisions were both created, if I remember right, by the same rabbi. I could be wrong about that. But I do know it was at least one rabbi that came up with it for Judaism. Because their chapter breaks are sometimes different than in uh, Christian Bibles. And their versification is also different. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind, too. Um, so yeah, we have the same stuff with study notes. We have that separation between the biblical text and cross-references. Now, these bold numbers, I probably forgot to say this. These bold numbers are the chapter and verses you are in. These not bolded numbers are where you can cross-reference to. Like here it says Acts 4, 25 through 26. And then for verse 27, you have you can cross-reference to Matthew 3.17, Acts 13.33, Hebrews 1.5, chapter 5 verse 5 and second peter 1 17 and so on that's that's how these cross references work some bibles will have cross references going this way some will put them at the bottom of the page some will put them in this margin and some will put them in this margin so to any of you that are totally new to study bibles that's those are the different ways that study bibles will do things um for Psalms that have more than one uh, section. Let me see if I can... Let's go to a longer psalm. Because there are some psalms that are broken down using the Hebrew alphabet. And they're called acrostic psalms. And... In the... Let's see. I think it's... Is it 22? No. I know there's one fairly early on. All right, I'll just go to the most famous one, Psalm 119. Oh, I... um, psalm 119 is a psalm that mainly focuses on um, God's commandments and its relationship to people. Now, in most Bibles, Psalm 119, not only do you, would you have this subtitle here, but each section of eight verses above it they would put a letter of the hebrew alphabet or spell out the pronunciation of it um this particular revised standard version is not doing that that's fine they probably did it for uh space reasons otherwise this bible would be even huger uh, but yeah here's more of psalm 119 so like here there'd be a either a hebrew letter or the spelling of the hebrew letter's name um like in English, if we were to write, we'd either put like a letter Z or we'd spell out Z. Z-E-E. -E. I was using English just as an example, but Hebrew is different. Um, and like you got this, you know, same uh, thing with study notes where occasionally you will have these symbols. And then let's get to the New Testament now. Oh, and this one I should have said at the very beginning. This Bible does not have ribbon markers, nor does it have gold gilding. Um, me, I'll probably end up adding ribbons. And when I do that, I will do a video on how I plan on doing it. Oh, here's, an, here's a map. Um, to give you an example of how the maps are in here, in the, in the biblical text. There are color maps in the back. Um, so it even shows you like, this is north, and it gives you the legend for how far a distance is. So, like, I don't even know what that measurement would be. Let's see. What is that measurement? It's more than an inch. It's got to be more than an inch. Nope. It's about an inch. So, an inch is about 10 miles. 
So, from Jania to Gazara is about 10 miles. All right. So let's get to the New Testament. Oh. Okay. So after Second Maccabees, we have the New Testament. Um, for Protestants, it, the Old Testament would end with Malachi, but in this Catholic Bible, the Old Testament ends with 2nd Maccabees. Then we have a title page. And I like this paper. It's kind of like, to my eyes, I could be wrong, to uh, wrong because I don't have, I wear glasses, so my vision is not the best. But to my eyes, with this light and, and when I had it in the kitchen, this paper does have a slightly creamy look, which I like. I'm not really a big fan of bright white paper. I, I much like a slightly creaminess to the color. Anyway, uh, it says New Testament, and then we come to the introduction to the Gospels, and it gives us who wrote the introduction, and then it gives us a little introduction here, and then authority of the Gospels. There's a footnote down here. Canon of the Gospels. Formation of the Gospels, genre of the Gospels, historicity of the Gospels. In Bible college, I took a class on uh, the New Testament, and we went over some of the stuff like that. Even though it was a Protestant school, a lot of this stuff, as far as the historical information, would probably be the same. It's just interpretive. There'd be a, a, some interpretive difference between us, us Catholics and and then the the protestants um so relationship among the synaptic gospels for those who are not christian uh synaptic gospels are matthew mark and luke uh they're called the synaptic gospels basically because they're so similar they have a lot of structural similarities they're not the same but they have similarities um whereas John's gospel is different because it focuses on Jesus as God, whereas the other three focus on uh, him being a uh, prophet, king, and high priest. I don't remember which order, which gospel is, but those the first three gospels focus on those three roles of, of Jesus as the Christ. And John's gospel focuses on Jesus being the divine Christ, the ultimate Christ. Christ it comes from the Greek word that is used to translate the Hebrew word Messiah. Um, which I'm sure one of these essays or whatever will go into that. Okay, next we have an introduction to the gospel according to St. Matthew. Author, date, um, destination, who the gospel was written to, structure, themes, and you'll notice this one does not have a Christian perspective because it's a Christian writing. But we do have an outline. And this outline is quite detailed for um, the gospel of St. Matthew. And then we get to the text of St. Matthew's gospel. And then we got footnotes down here. They appear to be, I've noticed, consistently they're like, either they're at the bottom of the page, but they're either in this column or this column, which makes me think that whatever column they're in, the, the place where the note is for is in that column somewhere. Um, and then like some of these, like in most study Bibles, will tell you what language a word might be from or even um, alternate spellings or brief 
definitions based on that context. Hopefully there is an article in here somewhere that talks about um, Bible translation. It might be in the, in the very beginning of the Bible that I didn't read um, yet. And then it, it's got a long article here on the infancy narrative. Hopefully they go into some of the archaeology on that. We have a word study on righteousness, which is the Greek word daikaiasune, which is one of my favorite Greek words because it has such interesting range of meanings. Um, and then as you can see in the New Testament, there's quite a bit of cross-references. So that's, that's a good thing. Um, let's see, is there anything else in the New Testament? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That is something I just thought of. Um, this is not a red letter Bible. If you were wondering here, I'll show you that it's not by going to the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. This is not a red letter Bible. I prefer black letter Bibles. So this is good for me. People that prefer a red letter Bible may not like it. There are red letter Catholic Bibles. The Great Adventure Bible is a red letter Catholic Bible. Um, I think I have a red letter Dewey Reams too, so. Um, Catholics do have red letter Bibles for those who are not Catholic and wondered if there ever are any. Uh, this just happens to be a black letter Bible. I like that. Um, let's see, what was I going to go to next? I just lost my train of thought. Oh, the epistles. Let's go to the epistles next. And again, we have maps within the text. Meaning it's it's uh, not in the back where the regular maps are. These are uh, placed near where the uh, area is described in the text. I had to memorize a map like this in Bible college. And I, all I had it for a test was a blank one and I had to fill it out from memory. That was fun. Really helps you learn the geography. Um, here we are in Romans. I'll show you. Here's the introduction to the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. Author date, destination, purpose, themes, characteristics. And that appears to be it. And then an outline. A very detailed outline. Considering how, how uh, important this letter is. That's great that they did this much of a detailed introduction. Now let's go to Revelation also known as the Apocalypse. Okay, so, oh, there's an introduction to the letter of St. Jude. Now, hopefully, let's see, does it? Yeah, it tells us, you can use this to find where the, it quotes the book of Enoch. Um, at verse 9 and 10. I want to see if, if there's a footnote there that says anything about it real quick. So here is, where was it? Was it? Oh, I must have passed it. Oh, here's verse 10. So verse 9 must start here. Oh, here it is. Verse 9 starts here. Let's see. Um, I'm not seeing a specific note that mentions Enoch. Um, I'm surprised. Oh, wait, yeah, it does. Um, asterisk six. Um, it is not clear to what Jude refers, perhaps Genesis 6-2 or the apocryphal book Enoch, verses 6 through 15, or chapters 6 through 15. Yeah, I think that would be chapters 6 through 15. I have a copy of the book of Enoch that at some point I want to read. Um, 
Let's see. Oh, here we go. Oh, it was verses 14 through 15 that quotes the book of Enoch. So, there is a note about it right here. Um, here we go. Introduction to Revelation. And it's got a lot of detail. Author, date, literary background, interpretive views. And then an outline. And... So, here we go. And the word study is on the word revelation. So, that's cool. The revelation to St. John. And then in parentheses, it gives you the Greek title, the apocalypse. And then after revelation. gives you articles on certain symbol word symbols in the book um, word study on the word hallelujah which if I remember right is a Greek form of a Hebrew word All right, and then here's the end of Revelation. And again, there are some um, footnotes. And then here we have the indices or indexes. Um, yeah, indexes, that's a proper word. Um, so index of charts, index of maps. These are the ones that are in the biblical text. The, the other maps are here in the back. Um, index of topical essays. So if you wanted to look up a specific um, subject, you can do that. An index of word studies. And it gives you the English word. And then um, you can go to that word study and it'll show you the original language word spelled in English letters. Next is an index of doctrines, and then they explain how to use it right there. Um, and then after that, index, I think, is the concordance. If there is a concordance, I don't know. Oh, no, it's index of parables and metaphors and all that. Okay. Then after that should be the maps. Oh, weekday readings. Okay, weekday readings is the last index. And then you got a few pages of blank paper. And then you get to the maps. They're in color. Um, they're on glossy paper. It's not cardstock. It's glossy paper. Um, so I would not recommend trying to write on these unless you can, unless there is a pen that exists that will work on glossy paper. I don't know if there is one. I've never written on my maps and my Bibles. I use them to look up places and the print size is nice. And like for a map that would normally cover a two page spread, they do put a white separation so you don't have stuff going into the gutter. Um, although this is two different maps. But I saw a map, I thought, the other day where they did have a separation. Uh, maybe they don't. Maybe it was. Oh, yeah, here it is. Oh, no, they didn't put a separation. I thought they did. But here's a map of the Roman Empire. So when the Bible talks about Asia, it's talking about Western Turkey here. Or... Eastern Turkey, is it? Yeah, it's Eastern Turkey. And here's Galatia. And the name Galatia is a reference to the people speaking Gaelic. Um, so that means there were Celtic people living here. And then up in this area, there were um, 
both the Germanic tribes and Celtic peoples living up in this area. Sorry, I just love anthropology and archaeology. Um, Palestine in the time of Jesus. The Romans were not the first ones to call the land Palestine, and they did it as an insult to the people. It was originally called Palestine by the Babylonians, or the Persians, I can't remember which. And then the Greeks added to it by calling it uh, Syria-Palestine, and then the Romans continued that, of calling it Syria-Palestine, but in some maps they just call it Palestine. Um... Jerusalem from David to Jesus. Uh, another map, of, a map of Paul's journeys. A map of the churches of the New Testament. So like if you're reading the epistles and you know it's written to certain groups of people, well, here's who it's written to. And then this is modern Holy Land. It's so sad, all the fighting that's going on right here. It's so sad. And then end paper and then the back cover. Um, the size of this does not bother me because I have an ESV study Bible that's about the same size. And I've had that ESV study Bible since like shortly after it came out back in uh, around... 2011-ish. Um, I do really like this. I, ho I hope they do come out with a Kindle edition of it. Although I might try and track down the ebook version of this. So I can have a portable version on my phone. Or my Kindle. Um, I'm going to go see if I can find... I, I know where it's at. I'm going to go find the uh, packaging to this. And I'll read you some of the back. I'll be right back. All right, I do want to correct one thing I said earlier. This is not an imitation leather cover. It's a bonded leather cover, which um, bonded leather is basically strips or pieces of leather that have been combined using adhesive into um, a cover. There are YouTube videos on how it's done. Um, not by me, but by people who know Book binding and all that. Uh, I don't see anything here on here saying what the GSM of the paper is or the thickness. Hopefully there's a YouTuber that knows. Um, but I will read some of the key features again, like I did in the last video. There are introductions and outlines for every book of the Bible. 17,500 plus explanatory notes covering every chapter of the Bible, 20 plus topical essays, 140 plus word studies, 25 plus charts on chronology, kings, parables, and other features of the Bible, 50 plus maps on the geography of the Bible, 1,700 plus cross-references to the Catechism of the Catholic Church, Key annotations for deeper understanding of the church's criteria for the theological interpretation of scripture. It's 2,320 pages, 16 pages of color maps. And I'll read the first paragraph of the description. The whole scripture, Old and New Testaments, is now published in a single volume featuring the beautiful Revised Standard Version, 2nd Catholic Edition, also known as the RSV 2CE. Translation along with introductions, outlines, and explanatory notes for each biblical book, extensive cross-references to the Catechism of the Catholic Church, and an array of visual and educational aids to bring the message of scripture into clear focus for Catholic readers. All right, so it's actually a bonded leather cover. I made a mistake. All right, now I'm gonna show you the size similarity and some other similarities between the New Testament edition, which has been out for a long time. Um, for one, this comes with two ribbon markers. 
and gold gilding, so that's a difference. Um, the introductions to New Testament letters, I'll use that as an example of, of showing how it is. Hopefully you remember what it looked like in the other Bible. Um, but we got author and date, destination, purpose, themes, and characteristics. I'm trying to turn the page. Okay, that was the next page. Um, and then we have the outline. And then we have the letter, name of the letter. We have subject headings, chapters, numbers. The verse numbers are fairly easy to find. Um, cross references in the middle, like before. The notes. But let's see, this. I don't remember if this has the same symbols or not. Oh yeah, it does. These are the exact same symbols, so they most likely mean the exact same thing. But the notes are going to be revised in this over what is in... I mean, the new one is revised over this one. So let's go to uh, uh, Philippians chapter 2 in the new one. Hold on. I want to carefully open this because it's new. So This is just how I do it. Um... Plus, this will give you a chance to see that there is a little bit of a margin here. Um, another chart to give you. See, this one shows you differences between the Hebrew text, the Greek text, also known as the Septuagint, the Vulgate, and the English translation of the Vulgate, known as the Dewey Reams, and this current text here, the RSV 2CE. So, there are some charts like that in this one. I'm going to get to Philippians. Just give me a minute. But this will give you a chance to see some of the different pages. Okay. See, in the Book of Acts, there's even a map. See, there's quite a few bird studies here. Here we go. Paul's letters to the Philippians. So we got... Author and date, destination, purpose, themes, and characteristics. And we've got the outline. And we want to go to chapter 2. And I will show you. Here they are. Here's these two. Hold on. i got to slide this over a little bit. Um, as you can see... The um, study note subtitle there is the same, although it's bolder in the new one. Yeah. So let's see. See, here's one of the cross-references to the Catechism, um, paragraph 1010 and 1698. Um, it's basically, it's laid out, the page is laid out a little better. Uh, the cross all the print in this one seems bolder. I think it's because this paper is more of a white, white, whereas this is a creamier color. Maybe that's why this is popping out more. Um... I don't know. Yeah, like this page is, sorry, this page here is laid out differently. Because um, if you look here, verse 12, it says, shining as light in the world. 
and over here it's over in this column and we get a little bit more text here in the, in the New Testament one than we do in the new one. The cross references are the same. Let's see. This note here is over on this page in the New Testament. So it is a, laid out differently. And in the old one, there was a, a dark line here in a footnote right before the word study. But instead, they moved it to here and they've added a footnote. So there is some extra stuff that isn't in the New Testament only. And um, it's the same type of cover, only this is black and uh it's thinner quite a bit thinner but this is the new testament only um but it has um black end pages and it does have the maps in the, the color maps in the back so it, and it's got you know the, the footnotes the study notes the introductions the essays it's just the New Testament, whereas this is Old and New Testament. Um, this comes, to my knowledge right now, this comes in hardcover and this bonded leather cover. Um, there's supposed to be an ebook according to the copyright page, so I'm going to have to look up that ISBN number and see if I can find that. Um, but I'll try and find that over the weekend. Um, the day after you see this will be Thanksgiving and I just want to spend time with family, uh, and have a good day and actually take a little bit of a break from social media on Thursday. Um, I hope everybody has a wonderful holiday and Saturday will be the next Catholic Reads. Friday will be an unboxing video. So, yeah, I hope everybody has a wonderful week. I hope everybody's happy and doing well. Um, if you have any more questions about this, I'll do what I can to answer them. So far, I have not been able to find what the thickness of this paper is. Um... I don't think this would be 28 GSM. I mean, it could be, but it feels thicker than that to me. Um, but I'm not an expert on it. I will have to look it up online. And if I find out what it is before Thursday, I will make a post, a separate post in the community tab about it. But any other questions, feel free to put them in the comments below, please like, comment, and share this video. Um, thank you all. Have a happy holiday. Happy Thanksgiving.